some of you have seen we have a single ready to mingle book that's out we're really excited for that amen and uh, it's actually number one release on Amazon right now in the youth and the teenager in the Christian section and uh, I'm really believing it's going to touch a lot of people's lives amen I met a family uh, this morning and I really do not like to embarrass uh, people uh, publicly I used to enjoy that a lot more but if you if it's your first time if it's your first time today at Hungry Generation we want to let you know we welcome you let's give them a round of applause every person who's coming for the first time amen so this family is all the way from Missouri and they're actually on the vacation in Seattle area and they decided to drive all the way from Seattle after their vacation to be with us this morning and the young man shared with me he's like man you, uh, how he stumbled upon one of the videos and they really helped him in a very difficult season of his spiritual life and so he brought his whole family could you could I embarrass you guys <laughs> and ask you to stand we just want to honor you and Ivan would you be able to give him the book give it to the young man over there just wave your hand wave your hand we love you guys thank you so much for coming all the way and I just want to bless you with the book thank you guys so much for making all the way from Seattle and if anybody else drove from other places here today we welcome you as well if you're watching us on live stream we welcome you as well get the book ready to mingle single person and it's gonna bless your life it's gonna be available in the lobby today and stuff so um, without further ado I want you to rise to your feet open up your Bible or open your phone and we're gonna read the scripture together in 1st Samuel chapter 2nd Samuel chapter 13 verse 1 and 2 as you go in there if you're there already say I'm there if you are going there say wait for me getting there Bible app is loading especially if you got the new beta your phone is probably malfunctioning right now may God deliver your phone in Jesus name if you didn't have a phone or you don't believe in reading the Bible from the phone and you forgot your Bible we have a verse right behind you we'll read it together on the count of three one two three after this Absalom the son of David had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar and Amnon the son of David loved her. Amnon was also so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick for she was a virgin and it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her but Amnon had a friend. May God deliver you from those kind of friends that Amnon had. While you're standing for just just a few more moments I want to remind you that relationships is something that we have certain expectations of but sometimes we walk into a relationship and find out they're not what we expected we sometimes walk in not realizing the person we thought we knew we don't know a young boy came to a man, to his father and said father is it true that in China a man does not know his wife until he marries her and the father says son it's everywhere like that <laughs> not only in China the scripture says Ra Jacob went to sleep with Rachel and in the morning behold it was Leah how many marriages are just like that you go into sleep thinking it's your dream and six months later wake up realize it's a nightmare they said marriage is a sentence they didn't tell you it's a life sentence it's a prison sentence for some yes it has a lot of rings it has an engagement ring a wedding ring they didn't tell you also has a suffer ring and endure ring one of the biggest problems people have is they come into relationships with high expectation and low preparation that expectation is on a hundred preparation is on 20. do the math that's how much frustration they experience in their life for us to experience satisfaction in the relationship we have to walk in with the with the sober understanding of what relationships are of the spiritual reality and also to understand what love is see you have to understand the culture has redefined love for us the culture says fall in love God says walk in love how many of you know everything that falls breaks but everything that grows becomes stronger see the culture says love is a feeling God's word says love is a choice it's a willing the culture says marry the person that you love God says love the person that you marry the culture says if you find the right person you will be happy God's word says if you're gonna be the right person you will be happier and so today I want to let you know that God wants to redefine understanding of what love is making love doesn't make it love 
Love is not sex. Love is the value you place on somebody. Making love doesn't make it love. Love is not what happens in the back seat of the car. Love is not a feeling. It's not a sexual intercourse. It's a value you place on somebody else. And this morning, this afternoon, uh, we're going to just briefly touch on the third part of single ready to mingle. The rest of you guys can go on YouTube and find the first part which was on Wednesday and the second part which was on the first service. We're going to touch on love versus lust. You may take your seat in the presence of God. <laughs> Some of you were afraid that you're going to end up standing up the whole service like it happened last Sunday, huh? <laughs> for those of you who watched the service, Isaiah, thank you for... Uh, teaching us that it's possible to stand through the whole service. Amen. We're going to take notes. Write this down. The first thing is lust is pleasure focused. Love is person focused. Amnon, the Bible says he loved Tamar. But that's not real love. Because real love focuses on the person. Lust focuses on the pleasure the person gives you. That's why people who say I fell in love quickly say I fell out of love. Why? Because the moment the person stops giving you the pleasure you say you fell out of love. In reality you never love the person. You're addicted to pleasure. I think it was Rabbi Abraham explained the best about love and he coined this phrase fish love. I used it in the book in the first chapter and it really changed my understanding of what love is. I stopped saying to people that I love fish. I used to people ask me, you know, Did you, do you love fish? And I would say yes, meaning I love eating fish. But I stopped saying that because if you would love fish, you wouldn't let the fish be deceived, pulled out of the water, gutted out, fried, frozen, fried, and then eaten, and then still wipe your mouth and say, I love fish. Well, I hope you don't do this to everything and everyone you love. A lot of people's love is the same way. They deceive people, they gut people out, they freeze people, they fry people, they eat people and then they wipe and they say, I love this person. Well, I hope you don't love them like that because you don't love the fish. You just love how fish makes you feel after you enters into your stomach and your digestive system. See, we must understand is that love is not what I experience, it's what somebody else's experience is because of my actions. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two, love and lust. Love gifts. Love grasps. The scripture says in John chapter 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world that he what? That he what? Gave. He gave. I want you to see Amnon, he was in love, but he took the girl's virginity. He took the girl's purity. She said no. He overpowered that because he didn't think she meant no. Lust always grasps love gifts. It's love if it takes something from someone. It's lust if it takes something from someone and it's love if it gives something to someone. The Bible says in here is that he was distressed over his sister that he became sick. I want you to know one thing about love. Sick people don't have it. I don't mean physically sick. Lust makes people sick. Love makes people whole. Person cannot give love if they are sick, meaning if they're not whole, if they are broken. If a person is devastated, wounded, broken, insecure, they have no love to give. They only have lust. The only people who have love to give are people who are whole. Don't be attracted to someone who is in need. Yes, it will stimulate your Messiah complex of fixing somebody. But you will quickly understand within a short period of time that there is Jesus and you're not Him. And people who are sick need a doctor, not a date. Amnon did not need a date. He needed a doctor. If love makes you sick, you don't need a date. You need a therapist. You need inner healing. You, you need a counselor. You need deliverance but not a date. The scripture says he was distressed because of that love. That's not real love. Real love doesn't make you sick. And sick people don't have love to give. 
broken people don't have love to give many times they're the ones in need of love and that love is found in Jesus Christ that love is found in relationship with God intimacy romance is not where you find love it's where you share love you find love at the feet of Jesus you find love in intimacy with God you find love in someone who never leaves you and never abandons you and when you find love in him next thing that happens my friend you are free to share that love you're not going into relationships so they can fix you you're not going into a relationship to get a rehab out of romance you're not going into a relationship to look for a messiah you're looking for someone to love and in return you get love as well many people walk into a relationship needy i need you to love me if you're needy you need a doctor not a relationship because you quickly will discover that the person you attracted is as needy as you are and both of you are needy realize you begin to drive everybody crazy if you have the need go to the Holy Spirit get your life fixed get your life filled so when you go into a relationship you don't give someone a power to make you whole anytime you look to someone to make you whole you're giving them too much power and this power this person has will not make you whole temporarily they will cover your holes but then you will quickly realize they're not able to make you whole only God can make you whole and that person that made you feel so secure like Thanos with a snap of fingers they make you feel so miserable that person who was so perfect six months later you realize such a pervert that person you realize oh she's so fine six months later you realize she's so controlling so manipulative and her weapon is her tears and her words but you would know that if you would be secure and whole in God every relationship that starts in lust starts in lust because like Amnon there's a need that's not fulfilled sometimes that need is created with the absence of the father sometimes that need created with the fact that you just got dumped by a boyfriend or you you have that need created because you maybe just the demons are just sending you these these lustful thoughts and that need is there a date cannot fix that deliverance can a doctor Jesus can and when you're whole you're going into a relationship not so that something can fix you you don't go into marriage so you can get delivered from pornography you go into marriage so you can love on someone you don't get defined by the spouse because you already know who you are and usually you end up attracting someone who is as whole as you are amen, amen. number three love versus lust lust feels like love to those who don't know love lust will feel like love to those who don't know love Eric would you come up Eric one of these is alcohol one of them is water love and lust a lot of times have the same label they actually look the same to people who don't know the difference on the outside you know it's just strong feelings a sense of thrill palm sweating heart racing sleepless nights you are so excited to see that person like your heart skips a beat when they enter the room it's just it's exciting it's infatuation how do you know if it's just an infatuation or if it's real love Eric how would you know if one is water and first of all what do you, which one do you think is alcohol this one why do you think this one is alcohol So one is faded and one is clear. It looks, it looks pretty close, but this one looks a little more. This one's a lot more clear than this one. So he's saying this one is a lot more clear than, than this one. I don't know what he sees. I, I just don't see the difference between the clarity of it. Any other reasons? I mean, except the gifts of the Holy Spirit that's guiding you right now. <laughs> so what Eric is saying is you can't really tell which one, if you can hold it, which one is water and which one is alcohol well the, there's only one way to tell is to smell it so Eric would you do us the favor which one is that which one that's water. that's what I tried can you drink it 
It's water. Okay, praise God. <laughs> you never know. Okay, could you, could you, maybe both of them are water. Because this one also looks like water. That's alcohol? And how would you know that? The smell. The smell. I want you to tell you something. No, 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 no need to taste it. See, see some people think that I need to test a relationship to know if it's love or lust. And as a Christian, you have another sense. It's called your spirit where you can sense things. See, the world relies on the taste. You rely on the smell. You rely on your spirit, man. Sometimes you just have this tension in your spirit where God removes the peace. And everything looks fine about that person. They raise hands during worship. They carry their Bible. They're in church. But your spirit says something is not right there. Trust your smell. Trust your senses. Don't rely as well I'm gonna date them for six months and then find out and then I find out that they're abusive and I find out they're broken and I find out they're cheat, they lie, they exaggerate, then I find out they're not right for me. You don't need to taste. You can smell. Trust your Holy Spirit. Your spirit is connected to God's love and your spirit will guide you and lead you. That's one thing we have that the world does not have. The world has to test drive a car before they buy it. You can trust the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will guide you. Can somebody say amen? Let's give Eric a round of applause. Thank you so much. Eric, go uh, dump the alcohol. Yeah, do not drink it. <laughs> That's drinking out of lust. <laughs> Makes you a little bit intoxicated and crazy. Number four, lust is passion outside of principles. Love is passion within principles. How do I know that Amnon did not have love? It's because he desired something that was forbidden. What he desired, the scripture says, God's word said it was improper for Amnon to have Tamar. The girl was 15 years of age. Come on bro, dude, really? She's your half-sister, dude, that's not right. And God said in Leviticus that bros should not date their sisters. Half-sisters. God's word was very clear. Do not be with someone who is part of your biological family. But see God's word also says don't be unequally yoked with those who have not your faith. God's word also says that a man should be with a woman and the woman should be with the man. God's word also says these things but the problem a lot of times is that we have a passion that's raging and this is how you know that that passion is not love if that passion violates God's principles. As a Christian for us it's sin. Now if you are here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ I want to tell you something you actually have a free pass. You actually can follow your passions. It's not wise but you can do that. Why? Because you are the Lord of your life. You are the God of your life. You are your own supreme ruler. Like North Korea has their supreme ruler. You got your own. It's you. You are in charge of you. You are the savior of you. So you can do whatever you want. As Christians, we have surrendered that right when we gave our life to Jesus. We accepted him as our savior and accepted him as our Lord. Can somebody say amen? His word becomes the regulation for our passion. We submit our passions to him. We don't go in and try to change God's word to fulfill our passions. We let God's word control our passions. Sometimes you're 15 years of age and you're sexually God awakened. You realize girls exist and they're cute. But it's not right time for you. So what do you do? You don't go dating around like the world does. You go in and you put your feelings into God's feet and say, Lord, it's not my time. And then you submit him. Why? Because you're not ready to date if you're not ready for marriage. <gasps> did you just say that? I did. But what about high school? Half of people who are cool in high school will become fools 10, 20 years down the road. Divorced and children from every continent. That's not your destiny. That's not your calling. Don't follow the crowd. Don't follow the world. God never called you to fit in. He called you to stand out. You have a Lord. His name is Jesus. God wants you to spend your high school years finishing school. Get the best grades. 
God wants you to finish your high school years getting into some college. God wants you to finish your high school years picking up a hobby. Learn how to do things in life. Learn how to have friends. Learn how to have hobbies instead of smoochy, smoochy, smoochy stuff at the end of the football games. And then when it's your time to get married, so you pass on to your girlfriend, not sexual transmitted disease and children from different people whose contacts you lost already, but you pass on something that is valuable, something that's precious. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, but I think what culture does is stupid. They make, they make fun of, oh, you guys are talking about these valleys, like valleys in the 80s and they're old school. That stuff works. And what culture does, doesn't. We as Christians, we submit our passion to the principles of God. We don't try to mix the principles to regulate our passions. You have to understand, sex within marriage is beautiful. Outside of marriage, it's dirty. Nah, it's not. It is. Very simple. You see this plant? The, the soil within this, within this pot is a soil that cultivates the plant. The very same soil. just became dirt. This is dirt. Within the pot it's soil. How could the same thing within the pot become something that cultivates outside of the pot something that stains? Take passion outside of God's principles. It stains your consciousness, stains your physical life and brings guilt, sexual transmitted disease, unwanted pregnancies, a heartbreak and you may say but it's just sex. If I just try harder you can try all you want. This is dirt. Why? Because God intended it for sexuality and for passion to be within the context of marriage pot. That's why the same sex that you can have with the spouse, the moment it's outside of the context, it becomes, you feel guilty. You're like, well, it's because I grew up in a Judeo-Christian Judeo community and that's why I feel guilty. No, it's because you're a human and God sets some boundaries and when you violate them, your consciousness triggers. You feel dirty. Why? Because you just took the soil out of a pot and you put it on the top of a podium. It stains you. You know, you can be naked when the moment you get married and you watch naked people, you feel dirty. Why? Because you're taking that soil that cultivates into the podium and it stains you. And you can, you can tell yourself all you want all day long. This stains. Because if I put this right now on your hands, if I put this on your Bible, if I put it on your dashboard in your car, if I put it on your phone and I say, isn't that cute? <laughs> All of you here today who are living in sexual immorality, you know deep in your heart is wrong. It hurts, it stains your consciousness. You know it displeases God and it's not helping your future and sexual sins are the worst sins you can ever commit. Do you know why? It's not because God has a hard time forgiving them. It's because you will have a hard time recovering from them. A lot of other sins never involve the depth of your soul. They involve, they will involve your body. Sexual sin involves your soul. It involves your spirit. It goes to the depth of who you are. That's why most of the witchcraft and most of the occult always involves sexual intercourse. Is why? So that a person can go deep into that Satanism, can go deep so that even if they get forgiven, they don't recover. That's why sexual sins are so dangerous. They, they stain you. It's dirt. You may say some of you will get married and you and it will be hard for you to have a sexual relationship because you're like how can this be now holy see this when it goes into a pot cultivates the plant outside of the pot it stains whatever it touches passion outside of principles of god they stain you no matter how much you justify it, no matter what you call it, no matter how much you dumb it with alcohol and pills and drugs and partying, at the end of the day when you're left one-on-one, -on -one, your heart will be stained. Your consciousness will be stained. And if it doesn't matter why it becomes a heartache and a headache in so many relationships when people walk in with these sexual promiscuities. Number five, lust needs bad friends. Love needs good mentors. Lust feeds on bad friends. Amnon, not only he took his passion outside of the principles of God, but Amnon, he also, he had these friends. We read, but Amnon had a friend. This friend advised him to pretend to his father that he was sick, to get Tamar into a room alone. And this friend, he pretty much destroyed his life. 
If you want to walk in love, you have to be surrounded by godly people. By people who are like God. I didn't say churchgoers. Because some churchgoers might not be godly. Surround yourself with people who follow Jesus. If you want to live in lust, I'm going to tell you already. You don't have to surround yourself. Those people will find you. They will find you and they will be insistent on being with you. They will feel comfortable in your presence and you will be in theirs. And one of the reasons why people who battle with lust will have a hard time connecting with good people is because they will say, I just feel awkward. You don't feel awkward. Your lust does. But, but he's my mentor and I feel like if I tell him what I struggle with, he will torment me. No, the lust will be tormented. You will be delivered. You will be freed. You need good people around you, especially if you're battling, especially if you're struggling. When I was younger, like, like a teenage, 15, 16, I remember this particular girl that I liked and uh, we never went on a date or anything. Just went on the mountain to pray one time. <laughs> Didn't hold hands, nothing. I was pure, holy. And I, and I remember that my pastor detected that. And I was 16 and you know and I didn't tell him about but he detected that and he said he said Vlad he said you, you're getting too close you, you shouldn't shouldn't be doing that and I'm thinking I'm like man I have a crush <laughs> but this crush was crushing me <laughs> and and my pastor because he he was my mentor he is my mentor he would say listen you gotta cut that off but I'm like man but I'm gonna keep this little feeling on the side for next 66 years and kind of nurture it and not do anything with it and then after six years I'm gonna marry pastor says listen in six years he said, you're going to meet 6,000 people. He says, don't promise anything. He says, live your life for God. You know, he wasn't trying to kill those feelings. He was simply protecting me. And because of that, I was protected from making that decision at six years of age. Oh, 16. <laughs> six years, that would, that would have been, I would have needed a doctor for that. 16 years of age, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus, that would have been too early. <laughs> 16 years of age. I want to tell you something today if you're battling with lust surround yourself with home group surround yourself with godly people you may say why is this important because your friends provide something that your parents or authority figures don't what do they provide influence everybody say influence have you noticed that when you said influence in the word influence there is this few letter word called flu in flu you know how flu works it spreads automatically your immune system is down somebody else has a flu they walk into the room they don't have to come in and lay their hands and you say I am part in the mighty name of G in the mighty name of flu I impart flu into you may spread in your body no they have a flu they touch what you touched and the immune system is down and you quickly picked up a flu influence spreads exactly the same thing your friends don't have to teach you to smoke if they smoke somehow some way it influences you and you begin to think it's okay to smoke and then you try to smoke and then you become a smoker same thing with drinking they, they they're around at first like no 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 i don't drink i, I don't want to drink and drive and da, da, da. and then next thing happens you see that it's cool you begin uh, just just the one sip but i'm not gonna drive home and next thing you know you're driving you're drinking and then you become an alcoholic you lose your license you go to jail and your whole life is wrecked why because of in flu your friends are like flu but you can have a good flu too <laughs> where they walk with purity the bible says to pursue purity with those who trust who call upon the name of the lord god wants you to pursue purity not in a vacuum but in a community can somebody say amen, amen. verse uh, uh, point six lust seeks isolation love seeks community amnon not only he had bad friends who told him that he should do things like pretend but Amnon, I want you to see where lust really takes off. Amnon meets together with Tamar and they don't go like to Dairy Queen or you know Red Robin. They don't go to Olive Garden. They don't even go to Starbucks where it's a public place. I want you to see how lust operates. They go somewhere where it's secret. Kick everybody out of the room and now they have alone time. I understand what I'm going to say is going to be old-fashioned but I believe isolation leads to fornication nobody fell into sexual sin in the community and if you did you really messed up <laughs> you just see a psychiatrist nobody lost their virginity in the home group mm -mm, that never happened there you know where that happened when you were alone and usually after 9 p.m let's face it you want to walk in purity 
don't spend time alone so, so what do you mean if you're not engaged you have no business being alone plus this whole idea well me and her are spending time alone and you're not even dating next thing that happens is the feelings are flying it doesn't help you to get to know the other person because the moment person knows you like them they're no longer themselves they're the best version of themselves that they hope to be one day and that version you might never see only in your fourth dimension image during dating let's face it we work alone perfume we dress the best our car looks clean we drive according to speed limit during the dating our brother and sister is an angel of heaven if the other person is watching because we are the best version of ourselves and that's why do not spend time in isolation and then these people do this they get married and they spend six seven months in isolation away from other people they get married six months into and they say nobody wants to hang out with us oh duh you threw everybody off of your life for six months people moved on and now you just want people to come in because you're bored and miserable and the only thing you had going is fornication and you're tired of each other my friends God's way is better and God's way is if we can show the ladder God's way has just few steps bring the ladder please oh okay let's He's gonna show you. Could, could you be kind to help me to this side? <laughs> <laughs> Babe, could you come? Yeah. So, four steps of the ladder. The first one, where both of you, you see the distance? Uh huh, Bible distance. <laughs> The first step is called your spirituality. Somebody say spirituality. So this is where both of you meet. Sorry baby, I know you didn't dress properly. We were not ready for this. This was kind of on the spot. Spirituality. Now most people, they have a problem. They're like, huh, oh, you know what? If you meet in a club, unfortunately you can't start with spirituality. You have to start with being secular. There's no word like that. So God wants you to meet on the spiritual level first meaning that you have spiritual things in common spirituality is the first step where you talk about things that are spiritual I know some people are like well I don't want to I don't want him to be super spiritual I didn't say super spiritual I said spiritual where well, they love God and they love you if you don't start there and you're afraid of some super spiritual people therefore you start hating people who are spiritual listen to this if you're a young lady listen to me very carefully Amnon did not care what God had to say not short after he did not care what Tamar had to feel Tamar said no he didn't care about that either if a man says no to God he will not respect you either if he doesn't respect the God who died on a cross for him mark my word you will never have his respect either and people who walk around say I don't want a super spiritual I understand that but you don't want somebody who doesn't honor God because it's a matter of time he will have no honor for you the first one is spiritual somebody says spiritual now the second one this is where you got to take off your shoes and you is, is social somebody say social social is where you share activities not feelings a lot of people they jump right away when they start with spiritual and they start sharing their feelings so they, I love you heart emojis oh I can't live without you so precious you're so cute no 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 you need to become friends you need to find out do you actually have shared common activities that you enjoy because after the feelings fade away six months into marriage and you're gonna stare into your Netflix and fight over the fact that Netflix doesn't have new TV shows what are you gonna do you got to have shared activities do you have things that are in common that you enjoy and after social is where comes the babe let's try this is emotional this is where it gets slippery emotional is when you see you this is where the emotional emotional has to be after engagement why a lot of people get emotional before there is any commitment a guy says if we get emotional I'll commit and the girl says I will give you my emotions because you promised to commit that's a bunch of baloney mm -hmm. you gotta be emotional 
because there was a commitment to spiritual things there was a commitment to shared activities and emotional is sharing your feelings not your nudes uh -huh. people today in our generation i'm just gonna say the way it is people in our generation today get to this stage and christians and I'm Christians I'm, I'm cool they can do whatever they want but Christians snapchatting their nudes to a guy I'm like are you completely brain dead first of all you know that stuff stays online all the time and next thing that happens the guy screenshots that this, this happened already many times and then he sends it to me he sends it to other leaders in the church and says this is the person who goes to your church that person who just requested them becomes your biggest enemy. You're like, ah, oh, that could never happen to me. Amnon raped the Tamar and then got rid of her. That's exactly what happens. God doesn't want us. The reason why God wants to live pure is so He can protect you. Share your feelings when engagement happens. Don't go around sharing your feelings and the next thing that happens is that there's no engagement, there's no commitment there, but you already express your feelings. Always give in relationship what you're willing to lose. And only after this, comes the marriage which we're not going to demonstrate here because what happens in marriage stays in marriage <laughs> come on somebody come on somebody <laughs> thank you baby you did it you did it great awesome awesome so what is the first step what is the first step what is the second one thank you baby what is the third one what is the fourth one physical amen Number seven, lust forces sex. Love initiates marriage. Lust gets the Tamar in the room and says, I want you. But love gets her in front of the church and says, I do. Lust buys a condom. Love buys a ring. Condoms are cheap. Rings are not. All of you boys, any fool can buy a condom. They sell them right there at the gas station. And they're very cheap. A homeless man can buy a condom. Be a man. Buy a ring. Oh, get a job first, by the way. It doesn't make you a man with the fact that you can have sex. Having a penis doesn't make you a man. Having principles make you a man. Having purity makes you a man. Having integrity makes you a man. The real man, stand up. Give God some praise right now. Lust, lust will take you to the back seat of Honda. But love will take you to the front of the altar. Lust cannot wait, but love, true love waits. Can somebody say amen? Number eight, love, lust hurts, love heals. Lust always hurts the person that you're engaged with. Love heals the person. Yes, lust has certain adrenaline, it has certain thrill, it has certain excitement and don't get me wrong, um, infatuation is good, the, the thrill is good, there's nothing wrong with heart racing, palms sweating and you know you're excited, that's, that's awesome. My only problem is that when all of that is gone, which will be, how are you going to land? I don't do skydiving, my sister does skydiving right there and when you go skydiving you experience a lot of thrill. A lot of excitement adrenaline racing through your body but you know that you have a parachute so that after all of that adrenaline is gone you can land on your feet not break them all of that excitement and the infatuation and the, all of that stuff make sure that you have a parachute called love so when all of that is gone you don't end up with a broken heart but you end up with a good heart a healed heart. Lust is jumping off of the airplane without a parachute. Oh you will have fun, <laughs> a lot of fun. 
until you break your legs until your heart is broken and then the very person you had fun with that was so exciting you realize it takes you five six seven years to recover from that great fun God wants you to have fun without breaking your legs God wants you to have a thrill God wants you to have an adrenaline God wants you to have infatuation God wants you to have your chemistry racing through your body all of that but within the boundaries of his principles not so he can control you it's so when the thrill is gone and you're landing to the earth you can land nicely lust is when you hold the hand of a person and your heart is beating really fast love is when you hold the hand of a person and you feel safe and you feel secure and biceps and triceps don't make you safe and secure there's something within that person that they have and it's more than their looks it's more than their eyelashes or beautiful hair it's more than their figure it's something within them and that my friend is your parachute so when the thrill is over the drill of life is not broken almost done number nine lust does not last love grows with time Amnon rapes the woman and you would think wow great the law of Israel said that if a man would take advantage of a young virgin in those days he needed to marry her and that's why Tamar looks back at him and he says well that's not how I expected to spend my first night but you know you're the king sucks but hey and he says get out she says what do you mean get out you wanted me so bad that you got sick you wanted me so bad you lied to your dad you wanted me so bad you listened to your crazy cousin Jonadab you wanted me so bad you took advantage of me against my own will and now she says you're casting me out is worse than you taking advantage of me why did he not want to marry her because that's exactly what lust is lust does not last you go from obsession of rage that's exactly what lust is lust doesn't grow with time lust spikes like a rocket and then falls down right away and that's why if you settle for those thrills you're gonna have to deal with the down times of it where you hate it where you're beaten where you're abused and when you cast out and you're broken don't settle for lust my friends settle for love it might be slow in the beginning but it's gonna pick up with time it's gonna grow with time because it's God's way and lastly lust will get punished love will get rewarded God will punish lust if person who commits it does not repent and God will reward people who walk in love who place value on the other person who treasure the other person the saddest part of this story is not the date rape even though that is really bad it's not the fact that a young woman lost her virginity at 15 years of age against her own consent. That's not the saddest part. The saddest part is the man who was the abuser never apologized, never repented. His dad never punished him. Maybe he felt bad because David himself committed some sins. And never once you see a letter, an email, a repentance. You don't see a psalm written by Amnon where he breaks his heart like David did in Psalm 51. He went on as though it was nobody's business. A few years later, he thought he got away with it. But God settles the score. And God will punish every person who takes advantage of one of his sons or daughters. The scripture says, if you cause one of these little ones to commit sin, and this is said by the one who is known for love, Jesus Christ. He said, it's better for you. They, they tie a semi truck around your neck and throw you into Columbia River. He says what's coming for you will be so much worse that it will be better to drown by a semi ch literally choking your neck in the Columbia River. That's what Jesus said who died for your sin. That tells me every abuser that takes advantage of girls or women will be punished either in this life or next there is no escape there's only one way to avoid it it's deep repentance if you were here today and you took advantage of girls as a man maybe you cheated you broke their heart and you willfully consciously raised your hand and you hit him God's wrath 
is hanging over your life and you will not escape it. I don't care if you have more degrees than a thermometer, you will be punished. You will pay for it. There is a God in heaven. If you would do that to my daughters, you would be sorry. But if you do that to God's daughters, you will be sorry. Jesus said that. God did it to Amnon and he will do exactly the same thing to you. Unless you deeply, deeply repent, just because the law didn't catch you, just because there was not enough evidence to put you in jail, just because there was not enough evidence and you talked your way out and went on to do that to other people and pretend like nothing happened. There is a God in heaven, He settles scores. And you break somebody's heart, God will break you. Definitely didn't expect you in that church today, huh? The reason why I speak so strongly about this is because I once was guilty of this as well. Because 10 years ago, in fact 33 years ago, 13 years, 13 years ago, I dated one person from our church and I broke her heart. Twice. And my pastor met with me and he said, what you did was wrong. He said, you had no right to do that. You publicly, you know, I didn't do anything physical, didn't abuse the person, but I knew that I broke the person's heart. One of my uncles in fact met with me afterwards and he says, if this would have been in Ukraine, he said, we would have broken your neck. I said, well, praise God we immigrated from Ukraine. <laughs> and praise God that my uncle did not have that power to break my neck. And I looked, I knew what he meant. He was very angry with me. He says, you have, he says, you just broke somebody's heart and you're, you're 20 something years of age. And I was like, I didn't do anything. I, you know, didn't publicly embarrass the person. And, but one thing the pastor told me this, he said, Vlad, he says, what you did, he says, it can actually bring big devastation on your life unless you repent and you redeem yourself. I said, well, what am I going to redeem myself? He says that in your heart, you always wish the best for that person and that in your prayers, you pray for the best to that person and you do everything on your end. Make sure that person, if they are within the radius of your influence, has the best around you. And when he said that, I prayed for 12 years for that person to be married with the best person of their life. And in fact, last year I was honored to facilitate their wedding on the wedding after the wedding Holy Spirit spoke something to my heart and I felt like God said I lifted that judgment I'm not saying God was judging me I'm not saying that God didn't forgive me for what I did but I knew in my heart God wasn't pleased because when you intentionally break somebody's heart it's God's daughter I know you might not see it as a big deal because you break up with people like this but there is a God in heaven and everybody's heart matters to him and it's time for men to rise up and stop treating people's hearts as garbage and treat people's hearts with dignity and integrity I know you cannot undo the past. I know some things cannot be undone what happened in the past. But you can at least be repentant and you can at least in your heart and in your attitude do everything you can. Manipulating that person, stalking that person, hurting that person, gossiping about that person, treating it like nothing happened or not even saying sorry and keep doing it to other people is not what's going to bless you in your future. Man, I challenge you today to rise up and be a man of love and be a man of integrity. Don't be a man who goes and breaks somebody's heart and acts like nothing happened. There is a God in heaven and He will execute judgment. I'm not saying you're going to go to hell. You might live in one though while you're here. If you broke somebody's heart and God's bringing it to your mind right now, you might need to write a letter, maybe send an email or maybe just in your heart just release it. If you don't have a contact with that person, just release that so God can release His grace on your life. But in the conclusion, I want to speak to people who've been abused. I'm going to speak to the Tamars in the room or watching us on live right now because Amnon see what I said about this story the reason why this story was so bad is not because the Amnon didn't repent it's the Tamar never recovered and one of the reasons she never recovered she went to her brother Absalom and she said I just got raped you know what Absalom said Hush, don't talk about it in our family we don't talk about this stuff put it under the carpet oh it's just your brother he didn't mean it excuse me what do you mean hush? What do you mean it's just the brother? What do you mean it's just my uncle? I, everything was taken from me. I don't know if I could ever and he pretty much put it under the carpet and pretend that nothing happened. Never took her to the doctor, never took her to a pastor, never took her to a prophet, never took her for prayer and the scripture says that she never married. She never recovered from the incident that happened at the age of 15. 
because you can't just put that stuff under the carpet and I want to speak to every tomorrow today who's been taken advantage of on a date who's been taken advantage with maybe by somebody who was supposed to trust you somebody that you went into the room to make pancakes but next thing that happened to you you will never be able to undo I want to tell you something is that whatever happened there you cannot you could have not prevented that it's not your fault but your life is not defined by that encounter in that room you still have a future and you still have a hope The scripture says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for He anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. That is the first mission of Jesus on this earth. He knows that what happened there is not your fault but He knows that there is a power to heal. Neglecting your wound will get Him only infected. It doesn't get Him healed. But if you bring your wounds to God and you say, God, I'm hurting. God, I've been taken advantage of. God, my heart has been broken. God, I feel like it's my fault. God, I feel like, you know what, I feel like it's because I'm ugly or because I'm not good enough. And the person moved on like it was nobody's business. God, it hurts. God will show His love to you. God will love on you. God will heal you. And God will restore you and you're not gonna need to go to the next boyfriend to just do a revenge on your ex. You're not gonna need to go to the next relationship to put a band-aid because you will go into a relationship with God and you will take time to heal yourself because tomorrow your life doesn't end at 15. God still has a hope and a plan and a future he says in Jeremiah. He came to give life and more abundantly. He came to heal the brokenhearted to restore but your restoration today will begin. You have to forgive Amnon. You have to forgive that uncle. You have to forgive that ex. You have to forgive that person. And I, and I know they don't deserve it. They definitely didn't earn it. It doesn't make it right when you forgive. But when you don't forgive, you're setting yourself on fire hoping that they will burn from it. When you don't forgive, this is what happens. A snake rolled into somebody's shop and an accident cut itself on this edge and a snake really thought that the saw was trying to attack the snake so it went back biting the saw as he was biting the saw he decided to suffocate the saw to kill the saw because the saw caused the pain and as the snake started to wrap around the saw to to cause the saw to die the snake killed herself whatever happened to you is a saw it's unfortunate we live in a broken world whether the person meant it or not whether they moved on or not, you must understand you cannot punish that person by hurting yourself. You're only going to destroy your future. The bite, the hurt that you got, God can restore and heal. That wound, God can turn into a scar within a few years. And that scar, God will use as your star and as your testimony. And you will move forward and you will move on. Do not go back and wrap your life around that incident because it will only cut you that person will move on. I read statistics on, on how many people are taking advantage, especially girls. It's, it's staggering. It's shocking. We just had a freedom weekend and hearing how many girls and guys as well but mainly girls go through this stuff that Tamar went through is mind-blowing. It's, it's just almost unbelievable. But what I'm excited about is there is a the power of God to heal and there is a power of God to deliver and there is a power of God to restore. I prophesy to every tomorrow that you will forgive, you will recover and you will be healed. I prophesy to every tomorrow that there is still future inside of you. I prophesy to every Amnon that God will deliver you, God will heal you and God will forgive you but you must repent. God extends mercy to the repentant. Jesus name. Thank you for watching this content. I hope this was a blessing to you. If you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.